Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this exciting event today. Um, why is reform hard in Ukraine? My name is Emily Channel Justice, and I'm the director of the Temerte Contemporary Ukraine program at the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. And I'm very excited that this new program can co-sponsor this event with Atlantic Council today. Uh, we're joined here by Melinda Herring, who is the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. And we also have several speakers who have been part of different administrations in Ukraine. So um, we, we look forward to hearing what they have to say about reforms uh, in the current administration and, and the potential for the future. So first we have Prime Minister Oleksiy Honcharuk, who is currently a Distinguished Fellow at the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council, and he was the Prime Minister of Ukraine from August 2019 to March of 2020. We're also joined by Dr. Timofey Milovanov, who is the President of Kiev School of Economics and Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and he was the Trade and Agriculture Minister of Ukraine from August 2019 to March of 2020. And he's also the former Minister of Economic Development in Ukraine. Finally, we have Dr. Sergei Verlanov, who is the former head of Ukraine's state tax service. Uh, he served in that position from May of 2019 uh, to, to April of 2020. Um, and he has also served as the Deputy Minister of Finance uh, from 2018 to 2019. And our moderator today is Ambassador John Herbst, who is the director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Over to you, Ambassador Herbst. Emily, thank you very much. And we're delighted to work with the Temerty Center at Harvard on this event. Um, okay, I think our speakers are, are well known to our audience. Um, I'd like to start with a question for, for Prime Minister Amon Sharuk. Um, Alexei, since you and many of your ministers were removed in March, the good reform progress of President Zelensky's administration seems to have stalled. What happened? Thank you very much, uh, John. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, it's a great honor to speak uh, to such a great auditory. Uh, I'll try to be uh, um, as short as possible because I want to not to have uh, today a long like you know monologues a number of monologues but i want to have the dialogue here my concrete answer to your question is because of the huge influence of uh, kremlin in uh, ukraine and still huge influence uh, oligarchs uh, inside ukraine we lose a lot of time after the revolution of dignity to repair to reform our court system and still, we still have no any rule of law in Ukraine. And that's the main problem we have uh, in our country. All another problems we can discuss, like uh, this constitutional crisis, but actually, frankly speaking, I don't think it's constitutional crisis, it's a corruption crisis. Um, another one corruption crisis. And uh, we should uh, name uh, the events, uh, name the scenes uh, by their own names, I believe. And uh, the main reason why we still are not successful as a country uh, with our reforms, it's because of huge groups and very powerful groups of influence with vested interests in Ukraine, uh, with Russian roots, with Kremlin, in the Kremlin interests, uh, in the interest of the big oligarchs in Ukraine are still very powerful. And we have no any court system to protect reforms, to protect their bodies. And we should realize that uh, in Ukraine right now, uh, we already have a young generation of politicians, of experts. We have uh, strong enough civil society uh, to um, be, su be successful with uh, all these reforms. And this short period of time, six or nine months, uh, uh, first nine months uh, after uh, Zelensky became a president uh, shows very well that uh, the reforms, fast reforms in Ukraine, real reforms, is possible. Uh, a great job uh, was done by uh, uh, the team of Timofey Milovanov uh, in the Ministry of Economy, for example, with the privatization, the huge efforts uh, um, uh, and huge attention was paid for privatization a huge progress of land reform and some another significant uh, parts. But it's nothing 
if you have no any rule of law in uh, uh, the country. It's impossible to attract investment. Uh, and uh, investment is absolutely critical for economic growth uh, in our country. Without foreign investments, foreign uh, direct investments, it's impossible to uh, grow the economy. And uh, without growing economy, you can uh, pay uh, the higher salaries. You can uh, solve. You can solve uh, the huge uh, issues in your social and uh, medical healthcare system, educational system. You can invest in the people. It's and so on and so forth. And uh, it creates the circumstances uh, when uh, you just can't uh, uh, show to the people uh, fast and real impact, real progress. And uh, oligarchs uh, controls and through Kremlin controls the media and uh, he creates uh, the situation, uh, uh, he, he affects uh, public opinion and uh, if you're speaking about this short period of time, uh, this president uh, pays a huge attention to the public opinion and he influenced uh, by public opinion very much. Uh, and um, But it's not a problem at all. It's uh, just an instrument in the hands of Kremlin and the hands of oligarch to influence president to push him into the wrong side. So. To make a long story short, I can and we can discuss about reforms, about some concrete maybe mistakes, maybe uh, not enough speed, not enough uh, political uh, um, uh, maybe not enough not not strong political will and so on and so forth. But in the end of the day, we have oligarchs, Kolomoisky and the guys like him, and we have uh, Russian agents inside the country like Medvedchuk, and both of them have huge influence through their media to public opinion, and uh, they have huge influence, hidden influence, uh, to uh, members of parliament, uh, huge number of members of parliament, huge number of judges, they play dirty games, uh, against uh, civil society, and we should we should understand that uh, we should be aware that they are very effective uh, in these uh, undermining games. The main task for Kolomoisky and main task for Kremlin now uh, is to undermine Ukraine as a state, to undermine our Ukrainian institutions, and to uh, uh, break to to. Uh, destroy all trust between uh, Ukraine and uh, between uh, Western partners, uh, between uh, developed democracies, uh, between um, um, foreign uh, financial institutions. So, and and we should be aware, we should understand it to build our strategy for next couple of uh, uh, years. Uh, I'm very optimistic in it. I'm sure that we will succeed. We saw our progress and Ukraine uh, or in nearest future will be a successful country, be, but we should understand what is the real problem. And one more time, the real problem, uh, at, it is uh, oligarchs and it is a huge influence of Kremlin. It's an informational and uh, hybrid war um, in Ukraine. Uh, that's my answer and thank you, John, for for supporting uh, uh, Western-oriented and right-oriented uh, forces in Ukraine so much in so long period of time. Okay, I would say that we, we support the people of Ukraine as they make their own choice, which seems to be on a westward arc. Okay, uh, Minister Milovanov, um, unlike other ministers in March, you resigned. You were not fired. Why did you do that? Did you think reform was not possible? I didn't like the new composition of the cabinet, so, you know, that's simple. You know, I cannot work with people who I completely disagree ideologically, in particular the new Minister of Finance. Well, <laughs> ironically, he was sacked, I think, uh, three weeks later. And then there were a couple of others in the financial and economic block. So, you know, I would be fighting day and night, tooth and nail, you know, useless. So I decided to step down. And the prospects now, I mean, reform has slowed down. What, how would you explain this? What are the main reasons? Well, you know, there's a change uh, from the type of the government that Kancharuk was, you know, just push ahead, 
no prisoners, doesn't matter what will happen. We are not afraid of losing popularity, which actually <laughs> did happen in the end, but you know, get as many things as, as uh, we can. So I remember the conversation with uh, Oleksiy a couple of times before the appointment, and I was asking, you know, what's, so what's your strategy? He says the strategy is simple. We're gonna do the right things and we're gonna work our butts off, you know, to get as much pos uh, done as possible. And I think the new team came as more like, you know, let's take things slowly. Let's find a consensus with the stakeholders. Some of the stakeholders, I really don't like those stakeholders. I think they're, they're holding up, holding back the country. So, you know, I think that explains why um, a different composition um, of the stakeholders, the influence increased. Uh, Oleksiy has spoken quite directly about uh, the oligarchs, but it's also at the medium level. You know? the kind of bureaucrats the deep state became encouraged that they can take down one government so you know they better kind of put some pressure on the next government and i think that's partly was also the reason why i resigned because even if i stayed uh, i would have been much weakened so therefore i think uh, it was a new equilibrium more of a consensus one but as we see it now uh, you see, it's just a delay of the same problems, you know, we can't, you, you can't keep postponing them. They will, you know, they'll come back hunting you either through the constitutional court or the local elections or something else. So these problems have to be solved, have to be addressed. And uh, I think they currently, the president and the, the parliament are in a difficult situation. You, know? do you, do you I realize this is a uh, hypothetical, but do you think if the political will was there in March, um, from the president on down, that the you know president and then prime minister Hunchuk and reform-minded ministers like you could have succeeded pushing through RADA the necessary legislation to conduct thoroughgoing reform. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, actually, as as more time passes, more I become convinced that what I'm about to say is correct. So I think uh, you know, had we stayed on, and uh, you know. Actually, the government should be just allowed to stay on and keep working. Yeah, we were young, uh, inexperienced in many ways. We were growing, you know, there were issues because of that. Let's, you know, let's just not sugarcoat that. There are tons of ups and downs, but, you know, you talk to MPs now, they're saying those were the golden times. You know, we hate you because we represent Kolomoisky, but those still were the golden times. You know, that's what I hear from Kolomoisky people nowadays in Kiev, that the new guys, yeah, whatever, you know, you were progress and pro-market, but at least, you know, we could work with you. So, you know, of course, they might not necessarily be fully sincere, and there's a bunch of ministers in the new government who are very good too, but it's the entire system, the entire perspective. So I think, you know, it, hypothetically, counterfactually, would have been great had Hancharuk, Prime Minister Hancharuk and his team, including me, stayed on and uh, keep going. But it didn't happen. And I don't think that hypothetical was ever, you know, in the discussion, you know. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Verlanov, Serhi, uh, besides the stall of reform over the past six months, actually more than six months, we've also seen a disturbing tendency to go after with criminal uh, by the prosecutor general's office and other law enforcement in Ukraine, reformers. Um, you yourself at risk, they're going after former President Poroshenko. Uh, can you describe your own situation? Unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for the questions. Indeed, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, change from from liberal agenda and the change of government, then firing off, changing the laws uh, in order to uh, firstly uh, have ability to fire the civil servants, which had a five year contract like myself and uh, Nifyodov and other uh, young reformers that were brought on board by uh, Prime Minister Von Cheruk, uh cabinet. So uh, all these changes to the laws uh, were made in order firstly to uh, fire uh, the reformers and then even more to hire without the proper, uh, uh, proper uh, procedures, uh, proper selection process in place, uh, the other people who are not necessarily uh, uh, bad people, but 
the the a lot of them are uh, at least the old school uh, bureaucrats that that are not pushing the reforms forward. Uh, not saying about the Yanukovych times people who are uh, we we see the bunch of them. But besides that, the law enforcement system uh, became a tool of uh, a revenge of uh, basically uh, populistic uh, populistic uh, moves from the uh, from the government from uh, um, from the presidential administration in order to increase their ratings uh, and a lot of reformers uh, among them and myself uh, became under attack uh, more moreover we, we can see that uh, the legal grounds for majority of such cases are uh, so-called legal legal garbage. Uh, uh, a lot of cases against uh, uh, ex-president Poroshenko, uh, like Thomas' case, are like that. Uh, the case we are uh, we, I am facing right now is basically the case where I was accused of uh, sending part of the tax assessment for the re-audit for one of the biggest uh, investors in Ukraine, basically the company uh, which uh, uh, which is the major, uh, the, 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 the mo which made the most valuable privatization, one of the biggest FDIs, Arcelor. Uh, and basically uh, I had all the legal grounds to do that. Instead of that, uh, I was accused of uh, uh, basically putting the uh, the tax assessment for the re-audit, having behind my logic a lot of uh, court practice, which was pro-taxpayer. Uh, so basically this was the administrative appeal reform we were standing on, and the logic behind this was to uh, keep away the uh, ridiculous tax audits, uh, just to uh, to cancel their results and to re-audit uh, re uh, such cases. So basically, uh, this is uh, mm, uh, th this, uh, the case itself, also the mechanics, uh, just to put a little flavor, is, was uh, investigated by SBU, the Security Service of Ukraine, uh, and this was against the law because such cases should be investigated by National Anti-Corruption Bureau. But you know, National Anti-Corruption Bureau is quite independent. So uh, Security Service of Ukraine invented that uh, the part of the crime was the financing of terrorism. So this is much looks like the uh, accepting the not the Western best practice, but uh, the best practice of our Eastern neighbor, uh, as we saw in the Sintsov case and in other uh, people uh, cases. So basically all this was set up just to make the fake uh, accusations. And what I, what, what I think that uh, there are two learning points and big risks. First of all, is that basically the system uh, shows uh, uh, and makes the vaccine against the reforms. So if you want to change something, you will be punished. And it's not only the uh, the high uh, the, 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 the high authorities or the the uh, the uh, ministers or 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 uh, the top level. It is also the mid level, as uh, Timofey said. Uh, the mid level is very resistant and they are also uh, looking for the chance of strike or to strike back because the reforms are painfully basically changing the status quo of, in my in my case of 25,000 uh, tax auditors and basically sending the uh, very harsh messages to them that uh, hey uh, we would not tolerate uh, the nonsense uh, tax audits uh, you need to change if you want to attract FDIs to uh, nourish the uh, business climate, uh, to increase the um, the investment. Uh, we need to get rid of the 
uh, of nonsense and uh, unlawful practices of the, in my case, of the tax authorities. So basically, the system sends the message uh, that uh, uh, that reformers should be punished. Uh, my case is basically a fake case on the on on uh, which which uh, uh, apart apart from this. Uh, basically, the the the, uh, the state security service is accusing Arcelor of uh, of of having uh, of the, done the, some corruption acts with with myself. So basically, we had an agreement of some of some sort, which is which is a ridiculous, and all this uh, is very disappointing. And the uh, also what we see now. Is basically the reforms are not talking are not uh, are not on the agenda. Uh, if the IMF uh, and EU uh, agenda is basically is is on the on hold, uh, the constitutional court uh, decision is uh, seems to be the I would say uh, quite uh, quite big risk. But apart from this. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, uh, there are a lot of other reforms and milestones and benchmarks that should be met, and uh, the uh, today's uh, government uh, is not uh, succeeding with the uh, uh, with the meeting uh, such uh, uh, benchmarks, and I would I would say that. Uh, uh, as as a Ukrainian citizen that was sharing the values of the uh, revolution of dignity and Western choice of Ukrainian people, I am not feeling the uh, uh, the good face, the goodwill of the government of moving westward, uh, moving towards the reforms. A lot of sad than done. Uh, and uh, this is what's worrying me. Yeah, thank you. I, I see Timothy has his hand raised. You want to comment here? Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, but I'd like to have a follow up question for, in a sense, the two of you. You both talked about the middle, mid levels. Uh, I, I am not an expert on economic transformation, but I have some information. And we know, for example, that serious reforms took place in Georgia in the early years under Saakashvili. 15, 18 years ago, 17 years ago. Um, and one way he did that was by basically firing entire um, sets of officials, meaning taking out the mid, mid levels. This is also true in some countries in Eastern Europe in the 90s. Has this been a failure of Ukrainian reformers for not trying to just simply remove that middle layer of old thinkers, people using working in the old corrupt system? Uh, first you, Serhi, quick answer. And then that's Timothy. Yes, you are right. If we would do it once again, this needs to be done uh, as soon as possible. The uh, actions should be more harsh and the uh, 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 real turnover of, of stuff needed okay, for the new people with the new values. Yes. The, I did that when I came in to office, I think in the first week I fired all eight uh, deputy ministers from both ministers that were being reorganized and united under my umbrella. It was very scary because you essentially are the only one and you don't understand what you are doing at that point and you are facing a trade-off between ability to control the execution of the operations and the political power to move forward. Actually, firing deputy ministers, all of them, was not enough. I had to fire um, two state secretaries, and it was a big deal uh, that we should not be firing them because they were political, not uh, apolitical, non-political figures. But in fact, they were very corrupt. So I had to get rid of them, and that was not enough. Still, the ministry was not under control. Still, there was sabotage everywhere. So we actually had to fire 15 out of 24 heads of the departments. And that was not enough. The deep state still was laughing at me 
as being, you know, a kid who is not going to push through and who will kick you out soon enough. So what we had to do, we had to reorganize the entire um, org chart of the ministry, which allowed us the ability to move to potentially fire everyone. Of course, we didn't fire. We only fired 10 percent. And that's when things started happening. So that's when they realized when it actually they everyone can get fired. After that, there was le much less sabotage. And I think partly this is why I was affected with the land law, uh, land reform and the privatization and the labor code uh, because we were very, very fast. So if next time I ever happen to be in that position, I'm firing everyone. So no one should, shouldn't be even expecting anything from me differently. But you need to have a team. If you don't have people who immediately will fulfill those seats, of course, you're going to destroy everything. So it's really, apart from the political story, transformation is very, very challenging. He fired tons of filled those positions with someone. And the moment he, he is not, that opens him to an attack of saying that you guys sacrifice the operations and things are not working. So you, you can, if you want to do a political reform in Ukraine, make sure that your operations are running, but you really have to remove a lot of people. Okay, thank you. I see that the prime minister also wants to weigh in here, please. Unmute yourself. Um, I have two remarks, guys. Uh, first, uh, in our in in the different ministries in different state bodies, the situation was uh, were very different. For example, in Ministry of Education, uh, we had the Minister uh, Hanna Novosad. He worked before he became minister. He um, she was a part of this team. She understand all this team very well. So. There, there was no any uh, any need to fire everyone, but in some ministers, for example, like Ministry of Economy, uh, uh, just described the situation uh, by uh, Timofey Milovanov. The situation was different, so the approach could be uh, very far, f fast firing or uh, very slow firing. But the general approach, our government was, and we actually asked about uh, Parliament to support our bill, our uh, law draft, to simplify the procedure of firing uh, new people. Because uh, in Ukraine, because of court system, it's impossible to fire uh, the people fast. Because all of them, the most of uh, the bad guys, uh, most corrupted guys, uh, after they being fired, uh, they go to the court and it's very, dangerous it's very difficult to uh, like to to have a new one on this uh, new one person in this position because of conflict because of war it's a ticket uh, for war and I agree that it's a big problem but it's not the biggest problem from my point of view because we were succeed actually it was more or less successful and uh, uh, with it uh, in our six uh, months working in the government the main problem, was that uh, the our reformers team and all our reformer I know generation and part ge reformal part of uh, reformist part of the, the government and, and other state bodies was betrayed by uh, our political partners actually. Uh, if you you mentioned about uh, uh, Saakashvili and Saakashvili uh, had the partners and one of their partner uh, uh, told that. Uh, to make reform successful, you need at least three persons. First, who will lead the reforms. The second, who will uh, imprison uh, the bad guys, who will deal with uh, the crimes. And the third one, who will protect both of them, both first guys politically. And we was betrayed by this third person. And we should be aware that the speed of our reforms the speed of our, I don't know, cleaning the institution from the bad guys, it could be faster, it could be better, I don't know, for 10%, maybe 15%, maybe 20%. But in the end of the game, it's not 
critical. The critical is another reformal part of reformal part of the team was betrayed by our political partners. And that's why it's absolutely another conversation. But it was the main problem uh, and uh, it was the main, I don't know, uh, event uh, in our story. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Melinda, I've not forgotten you. You've got one of the sharpest minds and the quickest pens following Ukrainian reform over the last five years. So my question for you is this. We have a difficult situation we've already talked about where reform has, has slowed, if not stopped, over the last, since, since March. You, had the, you did have the one significant bright spot of reform in gas distribution. But now you have this terrible problem created by the Constitutional Court. President Zelensky is now pushing hard to address the problem, but uh, some people claim his suggestions are not constitutional. A Venice Commission, which is a strong institution in favor of support, has expressed some concerns about this. How do you think this issue will play out? Thanks for the hardest question, John. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's great to be here with all of you. And thanks to our Ukraine community for hanging uh, and for your enthusiasm for our programming. It's great to see you know more than 100 people here uh, to talk about reforming Ukraine. Yeah. Well, I, 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 before I go to the current crisis, John, I wanted to make one point. I, I spent a lot of time uh, talking to reformers on this call and others in Ukraine. And the one thing that uh, stays with me is uh, as a result of um, working in the administration, you know, making a much smaller salary than many of these people would in, in private business. They're now facing criminal charges uh, and they spend a huge amount of their own time um, and their own finances defending themselves. And Max Nefedov uh, looked at me and said, a former investment banker, who in their, who, who in their right mind would want a job like this? So, you know, if I were in the Zelensky administration, I think I would maybe have a good think before I put more criminal charges against people who've done a lot of really good things, you're, you're not going to be able to attract top talent. Uh, it's an obvious point, but you know, don't put criminal charges on people if you want a talented team. Okay, to the, the crisis now, we don't know how this is gonna play out. There's multiple bills right now. It doesn't look like Zelensky's legislation has any support. There's a bill right now that's passed the anti-corruption committee in the RADA. Uh, this is uh, Rosenkopf's bill, and I'm being told that he's doing a good job. This is the Speaker of Parliament uh, trying to find a solution and trying to find a compromise. None of the options are good. Uh, you know, Ukraine really screwed up big time. And the three other gentlemen on this call can explain all the details um, more fluently than I can. But a lot rides on this decision. It's not just the ability to travel uh, with, without a visa in the European Union. It's at least $5 billion, $5 billion in aid from the World Bank, the IMF, and the EU. And it could be another $13.3 billion in early repayment requirements uh, if they can't get it right. So I'm being told that if uh, the bill passes, the Rosenkopf uh, bill, uh, I think it's going to be voted on on the 16th. That could clear things up. There's also three judges. Uh, there's three vacancies on the Constitutional Court. Uh, so that's an opportunity to, to appoint some more people. You know, it, it's a complicated, um, I, I've heard 10 step plans. No one has a short and easy solution. Uh, Mr. Han Truk might, uh, but it's, it's a messy situation uh, and it bears a lot of scrutiny uh, from the West as well. Okay, uh, please, Mr. Prime Minister. <clears throat> One more time. Uh, we should realize that uh, according to Ukrainian uh, constitution, uh, Ukraine is a socialistic state. You know, it's a statement. It's a political statement. And in the hands of corrupted judges, this political statement could be used for to destroy every single market reform. Every single. Because like, sometimes I think that all creative class of uh, Ukraine works for Ukrainian judges. And they were too creative, too creative. And we should realize that it's not a pro, uh, like constitutional court, it's a weapon. It's not, sorry, a problem, it's a weapon. And we should realize that behind this, we have guys who don't like 
civilized I guess uh, market, civilized law, um, uh, land market, civilized labor market, and so on and so forth. And their main goal to create chaos, to create mess in Ukraine, and to destroy relations and trust between Ukraine and Western developed democracies. Full stop. That's the main scenario. And all the other discussions about how uh, the, 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 uh, con some concrete decision of constitutional court can influence, one more time, it's not, it's not the main conversation. Ukrainian constitution says that Ukraine is a socialistic, uh, social uh, state, social country. And this statement in the hands of corrupted judges could be used to destroy every single market reform in Ukraine. Thank you. That, that, that's a, an important insight. And that would be an argument for a new constitution for Ukraine. But before I turn to audience questions, I want to ask one more question. Uh, the constitutional court decision, the setback that, that has given to reform, isn't the, the responsibility for this, besides being laid at the feet of the judges who made this terrible decision, go back to President Poroshenko, who refused to move on court reform. I mean, to really fix this problem, you need to have uh, a reform process which, which elicits honest and competent judges. I see Melinda's hands up. So I'll give not her a everyone, first shot at this question. <laughs> everyone deserves a share of blame for this one. It, it's not just Zelensky, it's not just Poroshenko. They both have pretended to take on judicial reform. Neither of them did it. Uh, we know that the Constitutional Court is a big problem and has been for many years. Uh, and the West didn't speak out forcefully enough either. I, I think that needs to be said earlier uh, when they went after Sitnik, when the, uh, the court went after Nabu, the West needed to speak out more forcefully as well. So everyone's to blame. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Otherwise, we'll, we'll turn to audience questions. All right. Let's see now. Let me pull up. All right. Uh, John, if I may, uh, Please. the last comment. Last yes, comment. go ahead. You mentioned uh, after my comment, you mentioned that maybe it could be a discussion about the new constitution. No, right. Every single another sentence could be used to, by other by these guys. They are too creative, John. Believe me, I know a lot of them. So they can use some any another statement. But I just I'm just trying to show you that. Uh, and we should react not for some concrete uh, decision of constitutional court. We should understand and analyze that behind this, we have a real problem. Um, let me go beyond my role as a moderator to make a comment here. Uh, when you said it was a weapon, that was a very clever way, and I think a, a wise way too, to describe the problem, which is it's a political instrument. And if you have, and the reason why you want real reform is to remove it as a political instrument. So it serves the function of actually providing a impartial, just view of how society works and how laws should be implemented. And that, that in a nutshell is the problem. Okay, audience questions. Uh, we have an anonymous question, which goes like this. Uh, actually, it's for you, Mr. Prime Minister. Can you elaborate on the information war and the harmful influence of oligarch or Kremlin-backed media? Why can't liberal Ukrainian media win a battle of ideas with pro-Russian forces? Surveys show that a majority of Ukrainians view Putin and Russia negatively, so they are disposed to distrust them. Yet you say, yet people think you are losing the battle of ideas. Why? John, if I may, as the last sentence, uh, repeat it, please. Okay. Yet people say that you, meaning Ukraine, are losing the battle of ideas. If most Ukrainians don't trust Putin or Russia, why should Ukraine be losing the battle of ideas? That's the question. I think it's very complicated. Uh, uh, we should realize that we live in... Uh, uh, post-truth world, yes, like, right. uh, and uh, Russia has a huge resources, 
and spend all these resources, a huge number of resources, uh, to create some absolutely wrong and dangerous ideas inside uh, Ukrainians' uh, brains. Sorry, uh, they uh, this what brainwashing process uh, is a huge problem uh, for our country. We should realize that it's not only a Ukrainians' problem. Right now, we have a uh, democratic crisis, uh, I think so, uh, in all the world. And uh, Russia is challenging democracy because it's very dangerous to Kremlin to have successful democratic neighbor uh, because it could be a showcase, it could be an example to the Russian people that it's possible to have successful country, successful state with a democratic model. Russians don't want to have such example uh, because they don't want to have democracy in their country. And that's why they create a lot of, in a different ways actually, they sometimes they directly talk to our people that uh, Ukraine is failed state. Sometimes uh, they, crea she, uh, they create uh, the picture uh, by pro-Russian uh, TV channels and in other media that uh, Ukrainian uh, civil servants shouldn't have a normal salary, actually. We had a huge problem uh, with this uh, problem in uh, our government. And it's not direct idea. It's like, it looks like very understandable idea that if the, in a poor country, poor people have a very low salary, the civil servant shouldn't have a big salary. Yes, it's like very simple idea. Uh, but uh, in the end of the day, if you have no any opportunity, have no capacity to pay normal salaries to your civil servants, you will have poor par, uh, country and it undermines the Ukrainian institutions. It's, and it's only one example how indirect Russia, uh, Russia attack uh, our uh, state. So, uh, one more time. I, can, I, I, I don't think I'm afraid I can't, uh, I can't answer your question directly, but the main my idea is that we are in war and not Ukraine, all democratic civilized war under attack uh, and under the challenge of uh, Russia. And we should be aware of it and uh, react on it uh, adequately together. Okay, thank you. We have, we have another question, which is in the same area from Arn Delhoff. He says, in a recent interview, Kravchuk said that the political opposition in Ukraine even questioned the country's independence. This is the enemy. Uh, and you, Mr. Hunchuk, defined the oligarchs in the Kremlin as a huge obstacle to reform. Reform is what gives Ukraine credibility at home and abroad. What strategy does the government have to deal with this challenge to discredit these, these people? In other words, those who are clearly opposing reform and related to this. Should Ukraine take steps and can Ukraine take steps against Kremlin friendly and oligarch controlled media? Uh, anyone want to take a shot at this? Um, and then we'll give the prime minister a shot um, as well. Okay, so to answer the first question about the battle of ideas, there's no battle of ideas in the media space in Ukraine. What there is, is um, a battle for trust for the government. So if, the, this, if there is distrust in the government, if there is distrust in the political leaders, if there is this trust in reformers, it becomes very difficult for them to do their job. And undermining trust is actually easy. You just need to divert the conversation from the substance to emotion. It can be done appealing to actual issues which are happening in Ukraine, such as people dying at war. And, um, you know, destruction plus emotion derails the conversation, plus appeal to the legacy of corrupt government, forces people to simplify, and so it's very difficult for the audience because the information is overwhelmed to separate good people in the government from the bad people of the, in the government. So people don't know the tale, they average out, they lose trust. 
Now, censorship and ownership control. What should be the policies? One is you have to break the ownership. So if a Russian funding is coming in to control media, that should be prohibited. If there are big corporations controlling, you know, oligarchs controlling media, it should be prohibited. But there is a deeper question. Should we be censoring media? And my view is yes. We have done that in the banking industry. We said you're not allowed to finance related parties. And that was a successful reform by Gonterva and later Smolli in cleaning up the banking system. And we see the results, the macroeconomic stability dis despite or in spite of everything in 2020. That is a consequence of a successful reform in Ukraine. So we need to do the same with media. So what it means is you're not allowed to talk on related topics. If you are a metallurgical giant, who, who owns a major TV group and you benefit from energy pricing regulation or from um, uh, logistics, then there could be a regulation that the owners are not allowed you know, to talk about the issues that are directly relevant to them. Now, this is very controversial. That has not been done. And it's a, an open question how to implement it. But this is what worked in the banking system and similar approach could be done. And the last one is the business model. All the banks in Ukraine, which could not demonstrate a solvent business model, have been removed from the business. The same has to be done with media. If media could not demonstrate how they earn funds, if they're permanently losing money, they have to be not allowed to operate. Because essentially it means that they are on payroll of vested interests. Okay, thank you. Uh... Well, Alexei. Uh, it's very interesting ideas uh, of uh, Timofey. Uh, uh, I support uh, some of them, uh, uh, especially uh, about uh, uh, to speak, to, to um, not to allow them to speak on the related topic, but I'm afraid that some of them, uh, if uh, this reform will be implemented, uh, uh, will uh, keep silence uh, all the time. Uh, because uh, you know me, uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, it's complicated because of war, uh, and these ideas about uh, described by Timothy about the model, business model, it's very important, it's very right. But we should be aware that Russia has no any the same regulations, and the huge and now. Uh, our TV channels, financed by oligarchs, is trying to compete for attention of our Ukrainian uh, consumer with Russian channels. And if some Ukrainian channels will not be financed, uh, we will lose the media field uh, by Russia. But but I absolutely agree that this idea and this reform should be implemented. But we should be aware that this problem is exists. And uh, I believe, I strongly believe that we as a state should invest in civil uh, uh, TV channels, Suspilne, like in Ukraine we uh, call Suspilne. We should pay attention and resources to build uh, not state controlled, but uh, society controlled um, uh, media. And this is critical. And the last point, I believe that. Uh, it's not a, this problem is not about only money, it's about people. Some of them, some people who invest and organize the activity of some medias, pro Russian media, is in the authority of Ukraine. I believe that they work directly against Ukraine as a state and they work directly for Russia, for Kremlin as uh, uh, aggressor. And uh, SBU should react on it. They should uh, look very carefully for this uh, activity, and th such that person who works directly for Kremlin should be imprisoned. Uh, it's very important to react on it uh, because it, it, it could be, it should be very well understandable that you, if you inside in Ukraine, like Medvedchuk, for example working directly against the state, against the country, you will be imprisoned because it's a crime. 
And if you are not uh, sh showing this approach for the people, nobody afraid is and nobody respect to the power of uh, the state. And it's a critically important. So it's not about only business models, but it's important. I agree with it. It's not about shareholder policy. It's very important, but it's not enough. It's not enough. We are in the war and we should be aware of it. Okay, thank you. Sir, hey, you want to jump in here? Unmute yourself, please. We can't unmute yourself, sir. We can't hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Just very, very concise, uh, short uh, intervention on this. Uh, all the ideas here are relevant. Uh, however, uh, the informational wars are only active against uh, the people that are doing something. When uh, our government was in place, basically everyone was from us was heavily attacked. Uh, our people. Uh, also was heavily attacked by uh, all the media, oligarchs, Russian funded, uh, anyone. Uh, and now we see that uh, basically uh, the new government is not so attacked. And as we talk about financial bloc, then uh, the fighting against corruption uh, is slowed down. The reforms are not there. So basically, there is a, a, a very warm rec receive uh, and uh, reception from the TV channels of the current uh, of the current uh, leadership. I would say that uh, this is uh, uh, just to uh, refer to uh, Melinda's uh, comments on how uh, the government and the state should retain and hire. Uh, the uh, the young reformers uh, and the talented people uh, to make these reforms. If uh, when uh, uh, when they was in place, they were basically bullied uh, by 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 the media, and uh, and uh, uh, as the result of that, I would like the political support uh, vanished. Uh, because the the uh, the uh, basically the parliamentarians historically are uh, uh, quite populistic, and on the other hand, uh, the uh, the teams that after they ousted, they basically they are repressed. So this is the double, you know, the double game. Uh, so uh, to to be to be kind to make the uh, warm reception for the. Uh, corrupted uh, governments and for governments which are not uh, harsh and on reforms and which are doing their ways and basically to punish all the um, uh, all the people with other point of view. Okay, I've got we've got five minutes and we've got three questions worth pursuing. So I'm going to demand concise answers. First question: Do we need? either a new constitution or constitu excuse me, a constitutional amendment to fix the constitutional court. Alexa, you have 30 seconds to answer that. Or actually, it's I just think, a no. I don't think that it is a, a necessary decision. I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Serhi. Unmute. Unmute. In my opinion, uh, Ukraine need, need a dialogue uh, to 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 have the to amend to amend the constitution and to redirect the the powers there. Thank you. Okay, Timothy. Yes. Okay, Melinda. Change the constitution. Okay, Melinda. I'm not a lawyer. Call the lawyers. Okay, thank you. Next quick question: Yes or no? Do we need to have a strong president pushing hard on reform for reform to succeed in Ukraine? And can Zelensky be that president? Alexei. Yes, but, uh, doubtless, absolutely doubtless, we need it. Okay, Serhi. Yes, we need the president who could push the reforms. Okay, Timofey. I oppose strong president model. Okay, you're a libertarian, we know that. Okay, Melinda. Of course we need a strong president to push reforms. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hold on. Okay. Can, can I have one more? Okay, go ahead, one more point. 
these boys have talked way more than I have. Uh, yeah. This discussion is very fresh, <laughs> John. When you look up at change in Ukraine uh, over it, it, since 1991 or, or even since... Okay, Carol- no, Linda, stop. I'm gonna, that's my next question. Okay. Okay, and I'll give you the first shot at the next question. Okay. All right? Um, we've seen, and this comes from actually in the audience as well as, as on my list, we've seen frustrated reform over the last 18 years. Right, we had a reform with Yushchenko, which and his reforms went nowhere. We had a reform with Poroshenko. We had a year of reform. We had a supposed reform with Zelensky. Actually, a reform with Zelensky. We saw what eight months of reform. Why is this? Why does the old system reassert itself? And for this, we'll go beyond our twelve thirty. Lindsay, you have ninety seconds. Ninety seconds. Okay, so you need a combination of things. If you look at the work that Vox did. They've looked at the three prime ministers since the Euromaidan. Yes, Anouk gets the best remarks. This team that we have here does not get very good remarks. And they're going to defend themselves and say, we didn't have enough time to do reform. That might be true. But you need political will. You need pressure from the streets. You need the international financial institutions to really squeeze Ukraine. And you need the pressure of civil society. And until you get all those things together, good luck. Okay, good answer. Timofey, you've got 60 seconds. Conditionality is a flawed approach. Pressure on Ukraine from the IFIs has not worked and will not work for structural reasons. It actually fits the opposition argument that we are being hijacked by in illegitimate outsider attempts. Uh, strong presidency has not worked. If you remember our Maidans, both of them, recent revolutions, were actually caused by attempts by strong presidents to become even stronger. So in practice, people will oppose that. So I think we're on the path of a slow evolution towards parliamentary system, and it will take some time for Ukraine to catch up. Uh, if you look at the data from the post-Soviet Union, no country with strong presidential powers has succeeded. Okay, thank you. Okay, Serhi, 60 seconds. I, I think that Ukraine need to be more uh, active and uh, more radical in the implementation of the reform. Uh, Some very bold moves uh, needed, such as uh, uh, total uh, change of of people, radical slashing of numbers of of all the public sector, radical tax reform, radical uh, radical, uh, governmental reform, constitutional reform and uh, this uh, this needs to be uh, done uh, under the best practice of, of, of basically nearest neighbors uh, who succeeded and that's it okay thank you Alexei 60 seconds my word is um, first remark to Timofey uh, from my point of view uh, the main visible uh, example of uh, um, first reforms in the post-Soviet uh, space was Georgia with uh, Kashvili. He was a strong man, actually. So it's like... Uh, when Not he, uh, work in Ukraine. But one more time, one more time. Uh, we have very, very different circumstances in different periods, uh, last uh, 20 years. And the uh, reason why we haven't uh, successful reforms were very different. But the main reason, main reason, the main remains the same. Oligarchs' influence and the influence, destructive influence of Kremlin, this is it, this were the main problem 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, and it remained the main problem now. And we should be aware that without solving this problem, we will have no any success, any real success with okay. reforms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Melinda, I'll give you the last word. Anything you want to add? Sure. I think that this is actually, uh, I'm sort of tearing my hair off because Ukrainian politics are endlessly frustrating. The tragedy is we know what to do, but we never do it. (laughs) That's both both optimistic and pessimistic. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. I'd like to thank our speakers for a very spirited discussion. I'd like to thank our partners, Emily, for introducing us. And we will tend to work with you again in the future. And I think that this this conversation will continue. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you.